Welcome back. Well, today we are looking at news from down and under. Well, in case you don't know what that means, we're looking at news from Australia. And this is from Sydney, Australia. Um, this, this news was put out by the Sydney Morning Herald. Now, in case you don't know who the Sydney Morning Herald is, well, in Australia, the Sydney Morning Herald is the most read newspaper in Australia with over 8 million readers. And these are old stats as of 2021, so it's probably even more now. So with over 8, 8 million. So they have the readership of the Watchtower organization because the Watchtower has 8 point some million. So we see that the Watchtower is headlining on some of the biggest headlines in the world. I just seen a, a news report uh, on the uh, India incident headlining in the New York Times. So these are some huge headlines, folks. So we're going to go to uh, Australia for this one. And uh, this is very, very recent news. I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. Uh, here we go. The Sydney Morning Herald. Now, Punishment and Control, the uh, secret handbook that rules a religion. A Herald investigation has uncovered disturbing practices within the Jehovah's Witness Church, including the system for discipline, punishment, and control in a secret rule book for church elders. And this article is done by Ben Kuby, November 6th, 2023. So it's today's news. And they start out with the picture, Shepherd the Flock, 1 Peter 5 and 2. And uh, now, in case you don't know what the uh, handbook looks like, I'll show you a picture of it right now. Okay, so here's the uh, elder's book, what it looks like, Shepherd the Flock of God. And uh, it's a book about control, punishment, and fear. So now, uh, when we look at this article, Shepherd the Flock, uh, the, the, uh, it's interesting how the news people got a hold of this elders book, this secret elders book, and now they're dissecting it. Now it's coming out. And the other thing I find interesting is all of this is coming out in Australia, New Zealand. They seem to be spearheading a lot of this. And um, all over the world, we see news articles, um, lawyers, judges <clears throat> actually referencing the Australian Commission and, and a lot of this research in Australia. So uh, thanks to everyone in Australia for uh, working and bringing this to light. So now we, we show the, the picture we're looking at here. Okay, the picture is a former Jehovah's Witness holding a tear out of the 2023 handbook titled Shepherd the Flock of God, Kate Grady. So that's, that's what that is. Now that book is based on the scripture. They quote the scripture 1 Peter 5 and 2. Now, Australia children, Australian children in the Jehovah's Witness religion are being trained to avoid life-saving blood transfusions and parents are being coached to thwart court processes that may prevent their children from dying, internal church document reveals. An investigation following an inquest into the death of Jehovah's Witness Heather Winchester, who died in Newcastle, after refusing a blood transfusion, has uncovered disturbing practices within the Australian church including the systems for discipline, punishment, and control contained in the secret rule book for church elders. The church's blood transfusion ban forces people to choose between risking death by refusing treatment or being shunned, cut off from family and friends under the church's strict rules, according to 16 former and current members of the church interviewed by and the testimony of many others. Some of them believe it has cost hundreds of lives in Australia. I think it's truly dangerous for children who are not old enough to vote or drive to be coached about how to convince a judge or doctors 
about a decision that is potentially life-threatening, said Fleur, Fleur Hawes, 32, a solicitor who escaped the religion and is speaking out for the first time. There's a picture of her right there. In public, the Jehovah's Witnesses' leadership downplays the impacts of its ban on blood transfusions, which are based on interpretations of Bible passages that say Christians should not eat blood. No one is ever obligated to accept or reject a particular medical treatment or procedure, a church spokesman said. That is at odds with a secret handbook for church elders known church leaders known as elders, which, according to former Jehovah's Witnesses, most devout members of the sect have never read and women are not even allowed to touch. The handbook, Shepherding, Shepherd the Flock of God and other documents seen by the Sydney Morning Herald, set out the lengths the church goes to prevent believers from receiving blood and details the secretive rules that governing the, governing the lives of its 70,000 members in Australia and 8.7 million around the world. So yes, this is a scripture that the Jehovah's Witnesses use uh, from Acts 15 and 20. And it says there, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. I'll just pull that a little far further up on the screen. So that's the scripture that they use to back their decision on uh, the blood. Now, the article goes on to say, I had to say to the doctors that I didn't want a blood transfusion, but a deep down I really did, said Sarah, a former witness who refused a blood transfusion while a member and agreed to speak under a pseudo a pseudonym, because she still had family members in the church. So that's what happens. People get shunned if they speak out, and that's the case with this lady. So she goes on to say that I had complications and emergency surgery. I was so scared. No one wants to say no to a transfusion. Nobody should ever be put in that position. It's a despicable teaching, a gross misinterpretation of a dietary requirement in the Bible. Sarah left the church and was shunned. I lost my whole world overnight, she said. I see my parents or friends in a supermarket, and they turn their back on me. According to the handbook, a 290-page document issued to the church's leaders earlier this year, Elders must direct parents in the sect to read and follow the instructions in a church manual on blood issues before their child undergoes a hospital procedure. Firm conviction is vital because a well-meaning doctor may adamantly claim that blood will improve a child's condition, the manual says. Parents must be firmly resolved, resolved to abstain from blood by refusing it for their children. Now, I want to repeat that because this is from the Elder's Book. This is done by a credible source. And uh, we do have uh, Elder's Books. So here's what's in there. The manual says, Parents must be firmly resolved to abstain from blood by refusing it for their children. So there's abuse of children. There's abuse of children. Australia's going to be all over this. Uh, we know that because they're already all over it with abuse and care in New Zealand. And uh, this is just going to open up a whole another level of awareness for the governments. Now, parents are told to seek out a cooperative doctor and train their children to defend their faith. Not to defend what the Bible says or their belief, but their faith. What is their faith? Well, their faith is in the watchtower. And that's what this is all about. This is a high control cult. And this is how they uh, train the, this is how they control the flock through this elders book. So uh, the elders would meet, let's say they, there was an issue they'd meet and they would, they would probably read from the elders book right to the parents and tell them what to do. So the manual anticipates a possibility of a court order requiring a blood transfusion for their child 
in a life-saving situation and coaches them to do everything they can to stop their child from receiving blood. So here again, we, we talk about abuse of children. So it goes on to say here, a wise parent anticipates court involvement, the manual says. So that's what the manual says. It's encouraging, it's telling them there's going to be court involvement. That's what the elders book says. It says that parents can inform the court that they are refusing blood on a deeply held religious grounds, but are not refusing medical care and have no intention of martyring their child. Wow. It goes to that level of, of instructions. So the manual notes that this setting may not be the best time for parents to mention their strong faith in the resurrection, as this may convince the judge that they are unreasonable if a court order is issued despite one's best efforts. Continue to ask the physician not to transfuse and argue that a non-blood alternative treatments be utilized. So what we see happening here is, is this book, this elder's book, through the elders, it's, it's coercing the people to act uh, within the interests of the watchtower, not within the best interests of the patient. Because if, if the patient is out to act within the best interest of the patients, the elders wouldn't be involved. It'd be between the patient and the doctor. And everything is conscientious. So, but here the elders are involved right to this level. So this is really important that this has come out. Now, the spokesman denied that there was a contradiction between the church's internal rules on blood and its public statements about free choice. The suggestion that each Jehovah's Witness will only obey God's commands because of some per perceived, uh, perceived threat of expulsion and not his own personal decision to obey divine law as he understands it is offensive. That's, that's what they said. So it is a rare occurrence for one of Jehovah's Witnesses to consent to a blood transfusion for himself or his child, the spokesman said. The circumstances and reasons behind such a decision are unique to the person and often associated with coercion or pressure from the medical staff. You see how they turn that uh, to like the medical staff are pressuring us? Well, this is important that we see how the elders book, the governing body is who's responsible for this in New York because they control the elders book. So we want to make sure we put the blame in the right place because there's blame here because people are dying, as we're going to see as we read on. Now, <clears throat> this elders book is, in, is sent out to all the elders all over the world and they all run unified under it. And here they are coercing coercing, using coercion, or what, did I say that right? Coercion or pressure. That's what the watchtower is using. And they're, they're twisting this and say, no, no, the medical staff are pressuring us. So uh, uh, that's how they work. So parents must be firmly resolved to abstain from blood by refusing it for their children. This is instruction from the manual. So he said that the church only becomes involved at the request of a patient and does not monitor, screen, or track, or otherwise record the personal medical decisions of others. And the church will cease any involvement if a patient is contemplating a transfusion, the spokesman said. Now, according to the handbook, elders pass the name, age, and telephone number of a congregation member who is to undergo medical treatment to the church's regional hospital liaison committee. Now we're going to show this uh, actually simulated in a little video after this reading. And uh, you guys can see this, how it works. Now these committees are groups of elders with no specialist medical training, appointed to provide pastoral care to church members, and sometimes intercede with doctors if there is a possibility of blood products being used in the treatment. Why in the world would a pastor get involved in your medical treatment? Pastor coming in, they'd be reading you the Bible, trying to be positive to you. But no, these elders, this is how high control this is. These elders that they call the HLC, Hospital Liaison Committee, they come right into your hospital room. And I know this from experience because I experienced this 
on on one occasion I was in for a serious uh, uh, procedure, and they got involved because blood could have been used in my procedure. Fortunately, it wasn't necessary. So, elders must inform the committee of the spiritual standing of the publisher, the patient, and his family, and whether unbelieving family members are involved. So, elders must inform the committee of the, sta the spiritual standing of the publisher and his family, and whether unbelieving members are involved. Like, why would that matter to a pastor? But you see, to these high control elders, it matters because they want to get a whole feel for the for the fight. Are they going to have a fight? Is there is there unbelieving family members there? Are they going to argue the blood thing? They are ready for a fight, and we'll show you in a video after. Now, the elders' handbook explains how the hospital liaison committee is tasked with helping the patient with selecting a competent and co cooperative doctor. The elder elder book explains. So these guys get involved with choosing a doctor. So if you have a procedure, they'll go out and they might even suggest that you fly across the country to the certain hospital that does bloodless surgery, uh, uh, who's paying for all this. They're not. So uh, parents, pregnant women, and other people who may particularly be vulnerable to intimidation on receiving transfusion should be paid special attention, the handbook says. So here they are getting that deep into it. If, if there's children or someone that's a little weak, you know, maybe they don't attend all the meetings, we should watch them and, and, and actually put more focus on them. Like as if a sick patient needs that in the hospital. You know, that's why this is so important that the news media is got a hold of this and it's, it's, this is going to be exposed all over the world. So this is just great. It's, it goes on to say, when there's a crisis, elders may uh, consider it advisable to arrange a 24-hour watch at the hospital, preferably by an elder with a patient's parent or another close family member, according to one church publication, advising members on health issues. Blood transfusions are often given when all relatives and friends have gone home for the night. And this is what that HLC does. They sit there in a chair. Uh, they'll take turns sitting all night. Uh, and they'll be watching to see if you're going to get a blood transfusion. This is how involved these this this cult gets in people's lives. Now, uh, this is um, Sherry D'Souza left the Jehovah's Witnesses in 2017. Being watched by the church while facing life-saving surgery puts patients and families under extreme pressure, former patients have said. And there is no personal, private, or voluntary process whereby I or any Jehovah's Witness could have made or can make an informed decision about blood transfusions, said Deborah, who has left the church but sought anonymity because of her family members who, are, who face being cast out of the religion if her identity was made public. And this is that shunning policy that they have. They shun you. They put you into solitary confinement. None of the family can talk to you. So if you take a blood transfusion, you're shunned, you're ostracized uh, from the congregation and your family members will shun you. So another former witness uh, described as rushing to Liverpool Hospital with her mother in 2012 when her elderly father was in desperate need of a transfusion. The fact that you've got a hospital liaison committee elder there means you can't ask the questions you want to ask D'Souza says, you're not at liberty to have conversations with the medical professions. I wanted to say, if he needs blood, do it. I didn't even get a chance. By the time I got there, the elder, the HLC member, was already there speaking to the doctors. These elders get in and start speaking for the patient. And I remember him asking about blood alternatives. And when asked about transfusions, the elder said, that's not something that's going to be accepted. So here these elders are making decisions for the patients, and that's got to stop. I'm so happy that this is coming out all over the world in news. D'Souza's father survived, she said. The doctors were standing there telling us, we've stopped the bleeding now, but he needs blood. If he has another bleed and, and doesn't have blood, we'll be calling you to say goodbye. And how I feel about it now, I know the whole teaching is bullshit. And it makes me so mad that the religion has such a level of control. And I can feel that. Solace structure in new light. 
The suburb of Denham Court of Sydney's semi-rural uh, southwest is home to a private complex dubbed Bethel that houses the Australian branch office of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The secure site contains accommodations for several hundred people, printing facilities for the Watchtower magazine, and a life-sized mock-up of a Middle Eastern-styled village, which is used for making instructional films about the Bible stories. So you see, folks, how the newspaper are honing in on this organization. They think they're making this big movie studio here, spending millions of donated money, and it's, gonna, it's a flop. It's all over the news. This cult is looked at as a cult, no longer a religion. Um, and, uh, you know, and we see what's happening in Norway, I see, could be happening here in Australia. Now, <clears throat> goes on to talk about, uh, the, this aerial view shows a Middle Eastern style village. So it shows this, uh, this new Jesus thing that they're building in Sydney. So this is really bad advertising in that town for this Jesus park that they're launching and they want to get a lot of tourists in to see it and leave contributions. This is really bad advertising. So now the article goes on to say, according to the people who have lived there, Bethel residents live semi-monastic lives governing by arcane rules. <laughs> that's, said, that's said very well. Uh, they must be sparing in the use of elevators. Those who need to go up or down more than three flights of stairs are permitted to use them and leave doors wide open if unmarried people of the opposite sex are in the same room. If they assume uh, an independent attitude, it is grounds for reproval, according to the Bethel rule book. Also banned is clothing that brings worldly sloppiness or sensuality into the Bethel family. T-shirts bearing slogans are unacceptable at Bethel. At dinner, it will be appreciated by others if the food is passed. You take only a proportional amount of what is in the dish. And some modern technology is frowned upon. However, the telephone is a very helpful instrument that can be used to the advantage, but please make your conversation brief. Uh, instructions from the church manual says that parents can inform the court that they are refusing blood on deeply held religious grounds, but are not refusing medical care and have no intention of martyring their children. Now, <clears throat> church members said the organization can provide believers with a sense of solace and community, and followers share many mainstream Christian beliefs. On uh, one di uh, distinguishing feature is the belief that the end of the world is imminent and will soon be replaced by God's kingdom on earth and that only 144,000 people will go to heaven. The local uh, religion is a branch office of the church's global headquarters in Warwick, New York. It takes instructions on doctrine, policy, and organization from a small group of male elders in the U.S. referred to as the governing body, who are the top of the religious religion's pecking order. The Australian church owns a large property empire, but its financial affairs are opaque. It controls a series... Just hold on here. From what I know, all of the property is owned by Warwick, um, but they're not really saying that here. But they're saying that everything's controlled out of uh, Warwick. It goes on to say the main register, registered charity, Watch Our Bible and Tract Society of Australia, takes donations and bequests and enjoyed a healthy financial position in 2022 with $10.4 million in assets. The Bethel headquarters in Sydney and each congregation is controlled by a group of all-male elders. Though the church does not routinely publish the names of all those in leadership positions, if an elder breaches rules, he can be removed from his role or kicked out of the church. The term for this is deleted. There is no place for women in the upper levels of the church hierarchy. All members of the church are encouraged to engage only with church-approved literature, and seeking higher education can be grounds for discipline and punishment. According to the Elder's Handbook, an elder may have his position reviewed if he or a member of his household pursues higher education. Can you believe that? Uh, how this religion, this cult, is inhibiting growth. 
educational growth. Like that's one of the fundamentals. And this is how they started back in Russell's day. When they started this religion, only one out of 10 people could read. And they really prey on uh, doing these movies. Uh, people that don't want to, they don't want higher education. So people don't want to research. They don't have that in them. So it is definitely a high control cult. So the article goes on to say, um, believers are taught that Satan has controlled the world since 1914 and only devout Jehovah's Witnesses will survive a looming Armageddon. And that's, uh, you look at that boy in the picture there, the fear, the, the one, you know, this is what it does to children, it causes brain damage. At least four much heralded prophecies for the date of doomsday came and went in the past century. The church developed the practices of continually rewriting its own history and spiritual instruction manuals, in part to gloss over failed predictions. Updated information is referred to as new light, and we've seen that with the we see that happening right now. They're releasing new light, uh, brought in from the 2023 annual meeting, recently. At the church I went to, there was a library next to the meeting room, said Ben Lynch, 24, who left the religion in his late teens, after learning about the science of evolution at school. It was quiet, and I liked it there with all the books, not necessarily studying, just flipping through the pages, enjoying the books. One day, the elders came in and started taking books off the shelves. What had happened was that the Bethel had just said, we got new light and decreed that the old books had to be destroyed. I asked what was going on, why they were taking the books away, and the elders just said, we, we don't need them anymore. And that was that, Lynch said. I've read 98, 1984. Uh, I've read 1984. So I know what it means to describe it as Orwellian. They're always destroying information, rewriting their literature, and everyone has to believe it's always been that way. It's like the Ministry of Truth. So here's a picture of Raymond Franz. Um, let's see if I can get you in a, a little screen there. So Raymond Franz was a former member of um, the governing body, and he was cast out for questioning the rules. So he wrote a book on it. Uh, conscious crisis of conscience and I'll put it back here okay <clears throat> now the latest list list of church literature that has been deemed unsafe was circulated among Australian congregations last month the list includes more than 50 of the organization's own books and pamphlets to be discarded or in some cases destroyed the church's rules on blood have also been revised many times the sex ban on transfusions was introduced in 1945, and the church later decreed that a Jehovah's Witness who received blood would be disfellowshipped or disassociated, cast out of the church and shunned by everyone in it. The ruling is based on the Bible's passage in Genesis and Leviticus, which says Christians should not eat blood, and an ambiguous passage in Acts 15 and 20, which says you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. And some Christians have interpreted this to mean abstaining from food, from blood, uh, within the context of food. So Jehovah's Witnesses have extended the meaning to include blood transfusions, which were unknown when the Bible was written. And the rules have sub subsequently been tweaked many times, permitting uh, medical use of many artificially separated blood fractions, products derived from blood, such as hemoglobin, but not blood itself. This led Raymond Franz, a former member of the church's global governing body who was cast out for questioning the rules, to compare the blood addict to banning ham and cheese sandwiches but allowing the eating of bread and ham and cheese. <laughs> Good point, uh, Ray. <clears throat> so barely seen my family since. Now the blood rules can lead to confusion for Jehovah's Witness and doctors. At a cor uh, coronial inquest in May, Deputy State Coroner David O'Neill heard evidence that Hunter Valley woman Heather Winchester, 75, 
was wheeled into a theater for a routine operation with an anesthesiast who believed that she had consented to receive blood, some blood fractions, if required, and a surgeon who believed she had refused all blood products. Winchester, who was a, a doorstep convert to the Jehovah's Witnesses, was determined to follow the church's teachings. Her daughter, Elizabeth, told the inquest. She felt that this was what the church wanted her to do. Gynecologist Adrian Cyril, who was working at John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle when Winchester was transferred there after bleeding following two earlier surgeries, said she had made it clear that the Winchester's life was at the risk if she refused a transfusion. And that's the picture of the gynecologist. I have never in my career counseled anyone so strongly about their risk of death, Cyril told the inquest, but Winchester would not receive blood. I had sleepless nights, she said. So can you imagine the doctor couldn't sleep at night because of this, this no blood issue? So Winchester died four days after her initial operation on September 27, 2019. The coronial findings into her care and medical treatment are not, not yet finalized. Former witness recalls being trained as children to refuse blood at all costs and to always carry a no blood card, a form of the advanced medical care directive. As a nine-year-old child before having a small abdominal operation, I repeated to the doctors what my parents had already told them, that I couldn't have a blood transfusion, Deborah said. Hawes recalls carrying a card as a child and described being coached to refuse transfusions many times in twice-weekly congregation meetings. You're in a small group setting, talking about refusing blood because it's what Jehovah wants, she said. There's no option to ask questions. Hawes, who was regarded as a rising star of the church in her early teens and spoke at church conventions in front of thousands of people, started veering away from Jehovah's Witnesses because she felt it was sexist and oppressive. I'd learned about first and second wave feminists, feminism at school, she said, and I wasn't just going to live out my life to serve men. Good for her. So there's a picture of her. And she's a lawyer, so, so it's really good to have her on our side working uh, to abolish this, uh, this so-called religion from being classified as a religion. And I think that's what's going to happen. Just like in Norway, the, the countries are going to say, no more are we going to call these organizations charities. They're cults, they're sex, and they're destructive. And they harm and brainwash children. And that's what this is really showing. So that's, uh, this is great work, um, great news coming out in the Sydney uh, newspaper. We'll put a link to it. There is a paywall on this, but we'll put a link to it in the article uh, or in our descriptions of our video. Now, she goes on to say her, par her parents wanted to homeschool her, and that was the catalyst for Hawes leaving. She was cast out and shunned by her family at 16. She says, I remember walking to the street corner with my school bag on my back, going to the fish and chip shop and calling my friends mum. That was it. I worked lots of jobs, slept on couches, made my way through school, and I've barely seen my family since. Can you imagine? Just, just because she um, wanted to get some education, didn't want to be homeschooled. Shunning is a weapon that forces church members to conform Former members said, interviewees described a consistent pattern of congregation members reporting any unorthodox behavior to elders and the blood policy being policed by elders in the hospital liaison committees. An elder serving on a hospital liaison committee who spoke on the condition of anonymity said that the committee's main role was providing emotional support to Jehovah's Witnesses and talking with medical staff about the sex requirements. The aim is to give people information and ensure people know that there are, are alternatives to blood and we're not there to spy on anyone. We aim to help. <clears throat> Former church, this is what they say. 
and that's not true. They're they're spying, they're reporting. Uh, it's just a high control cult. Now, former church elder John Vinnie served on a hospital liaison committee for 15 years in Britain, which has the same church structure as Australia. I was a faithful and loyal JW through and through, he said. I saw my role as actually helping save lives on JW patients and providing information on how the medical situation could be handled to meet the patient's viewpoint, but also provide medical needs from a hospital standpoint. Vinny's view of the church soured after he was forced to shun his own daughters and he now campaigns against the shunning of children. The shunning of people you love, completely avoiding them, is a killer as far as I'm concerned. I always thought this and had trouble accepting it, but such was the cult's mentality that not only did it happen to my family, but as an elder I was disfellowshipped. I disfellowshipped others. It's a wicked cult control mechanism. So he had to disfellowship people, this, this guy. He was an elder, right? He was working in the HLC. But then he, his daughters, something happened, and he, had, he was forced to shun his own daughters. And that's when he changed. So um, what, a, what a thing here. Shepherding from the flock book, it says, Judge, Judging repentance is not simply a matter of determining whether the wrongdoer is weak or wicked. Like, who is it to these elders to determine that someone's weak or wicked? These, these guys have no skills, no, no skills, family counseling skills or anything. Half these guys are janitors or window cleaners. They don't get higher education. And yet, they're put in charge of a person's life? Their, their, their medical issues? They get right into their hospital records, right in, right in their noses, right in at the hospital. When you're having a procedure, they're right there sitting in a chair right next to you. It's, it's awful. Now, it's an invasion of privacy. Now, the church's spokesman said how each parent chooses to raise their own children is up to them. And naturally, many will choose to raise them in accordance with their own religious beliefs. And when it comes to medical care, witness parents seek out the best possible medical care for their children. That's what they say. It is unclear how many people may have died as a result of refusing transfusions in line with the sex blood policy. The Red Cross estimates one in three Australians require a blood transfusion at some point in their lives. Since leaving the church, Sherry D'Souza has helped run a support group, Recovering from Religion, which calls for the watertight confidentiality around a patient's medical decision making. So church authorities cannot know if a person has agreed to a blood transfusion. So here they have to help people to skirt this elder's book, skirt the issues, skirt the policing of this organization because these people don't want to get disfellowshipped and they don't want to be shunned for the rest of their life. So this is what's happening. Now the hospital liaison committee that the JWs put, put in place invade people's privacy, she said, and I agree. And there aren't any statistics to tell us how many people have died. Anecdotally, there are many. A global church whistleblower group based in the U.S. advocates for Jehovah's Witnesses for reform on blood has attempted to estimate the death toll in which refusal of blood transfusions was a major or contributing factor, basing its research on the data about transfusions in the wider community. Re reaching precise figures is not possible because of a lack of data due to the patient privacy. The estimate of annual deaths in Australia would be between 10 and 18, assuming 68,000 members. And the group spokesman who goes by the pseudo name of Lee Elder said, if we assume the ratio of members has been relatively the same with the average number of worldwide members over the past 62 years, we can extrapolate that somewhere between 632 and 1,096 Australian Jehovah's Witnesses have likely died prematurely as a result of following the Watchtower's blood policy. Can you imagine, folks, a thousand people dying because of a cult's belief on blood? And it's not even supported by the Bible. 
Now, the Jehovah's Witness spokesman said the idea that the blood policy had led to any deaths was completely unfounded and said medical literature backs up the church's view that the patients have better outcomes when they avoid transfusions. And many peer-reviewed studies suggest transfusions should be only used when essential, but no studies support the idea that they should be banned. NSW Health said it respects and upholds the wishes of any individuals and will adhere to their choices regarding the administration of blood products. So that's like the hospitals. The, you know, if you say you don't want blood products, well, they'll, they'll listen to you. Now, the department did not directly respond to the questions about whether hospital liaison committees played a role in policing the medical care choices of church members or what steps were taken in hospitals to make sure Jehovah's Witness patients were not making decisions about medical care under duress. And I think this has to be looked at into a more serious matter. I think liaison committees should be outlawed from, from being in any hospital. I, th I think that's what this has to do. And we have to stand up to this as a people. We, we have to put our voices out and talk about this. Now it goes on to say, as established in Australia case law, all adult patients in capacity have the right to refuse any medical treatment, even in the case where that decision may lead to their death. And this is what the health people say. So you can refuse treatment, uh, even if it's gonna lead to your death, you have that right. Similar to a person giving consent to a medical treatment, a refusal of treatment must be freely given, specific and informed. According to the elders' handbook, if blood is administered to a patient, elders at the patient's congregation are required to set up a committee to determine the individual's attitude. This is what their elders' book is saying. And in that, in that section of the handbook devoted to judging repentance after a member of the religion is deemed to have broken the rules, elders' committees are given some guidelines. Now, the committee must be convinced that the wrongdoer has a changed heart condition and that he has a zeal to right and wrong and that he is absolutely determined to avoid it in the future, the handbook says. Judging repentance is not simply a matter of determining whether the wrongdoer is weak or wicked. Weakness is not synonymous with repentance. So that's the uh, end of that article. So quite interesting, quite interesting. So when we uh, recap everything and we think of all the information that we just went through about what's happening in Australia, uh, I, th I think of control, punishment, and fear. And that's what that secret handbook's about. It's about controlling people. It's about how to punish the people. And uh, it's about fear and fear of the elders. Not even a woman can touch that book. Imagine that. If you're a, a father, you know, that they call that the head of the house. And if he's an elder, he's given extra special treatment and uh, if you're a son of the family and you become um, an elder as a son, you and the father can sit there and look over this elder's book together. But the wife has to be in another room. She can't be part of the conversation. It's private. It's secret. So now this secret book is out. It's out in the public. The news media has it. They will expose it properly and legally. And now we worldwide, we start to expose more layers of this uh, dangerous cult. And when we use the words dangerous cult, it is. If, if people are dying over its blood doctrine and they're pressuring and coercing children into scripting this stuff and what to say and the children, they don't, they don't have the ability to make that decision and, and die. It's just, it's not fair to the child. So this is all coming out and uh, it's important that it comes out. Now, for a lot of you out there that maybe this is brand new to you, you're unaware of the NHLC, how this all works in a hospital room, we're going to take a look at a video that uh, it's its a reenactment of, uh, of Anthony Morris dying. And uh, it's a video that's put out by Watchtower Help helper and um, I'll put a link to the video in the descriptions below. So we're just going to play part of it and uh, I'll get over to another screen here 
and then you'll see how this all works. So I'm going to get off the screen and uh, here we go. Nurse, isn't this our DWI patient? I ordered two units of blood, a CAT scan, and booking the OR for emergency surgery. The man has internal bleeding, so there's no time to lose. What's he still doing here? It looks like you've done nothing. He's not even hooked up to oxygen. What? He's a Jew? No, not a Jew, a JW, a Jehovah's Witness. They're the ones who won't take blood. So, Dr. Henderson said it was pointless to do anything else, because without blood, he'll be dead in a few minutes no matter what we do. The man came in unconscious. How do you know he's a JW? He had one of these. I recognize it from other patients I've seen. And our chaplain, Pastor Russ, has seen the patient on the internet. Yes, it's Anthony Morris III. He's one of their leaders, the governing body they call themselves. He's a real stickler on their prohibition on blood. Well, page Dr. Charles and ask him to declare the man incompetent to make his own medical decisions. Then give him the blood, stat. No! You can't do that! That's a violation of the laws of God and man! Excuse me, but who are you? A family member? I'm Fred Krantz of the HLC, the Hospital Liaison Committee. I'm here to ensure this man's wishes are honored and his rights are respected, and to explain to you what blood fractions he can and cannot accept in order to maintain his integrity to Jehovah, our God. A lawyer? No. Has the patient legally given you power of attorney? Well, no. Then you have no business being here. Get out of here before I call security. This man's life is in danger and you're wasting our time. No. Brother Morris would want me here, defending his religious freedom. It's all a mistake, though. You know, your ban on blood. It's not against God's law to accept blood. Oh, I'd expect as much from a clergyman. Have you never read Acts chapter 15? For the Holy Spirit and we ourselves have favored adding no further burden to you except these necessary things, to keep abstaining from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you carefully keep yourselves from these things, you will prosper. Good health to you. Injecting blood into your veins is not abstaining from blood. Yes, I have read that. Have you ever read Leviticus 19 verse 19? You should keep my statutes. You must not interbreed two sorts of your domestic animals. You must not sow your field with two sorts of seed, and you must not wear a garment made with two sorts of thread mixed together. Care to show us the label on your suit? I'll bet it violates that last biblical rule. It's a wool and silk blend. So, what? That's from the Mosaic Law. That law passed away with Jesus' sacrifice. It's not binding on Christians today. Oh, so you're saying that we must consider the context of a scripture and not just yank it out and follow it as if it necessarily applies to us today? Of course. So then, maybe if we considered the context of abstain from blood, it would reveal the fact that it too is not something binding on Christians today. In the first place, this is not a commandment from God or Jesus. It is the words of someone named James. Who is this James, and why should we assume that he had any business encumbering Christians with such rules? When Jesus was asked what the commandments were, did he mention any of these dietary restrictions? No, he did not. He stated two commandments to rule all behavior, to love God and to love your neighbor. So, why would James, as a follower of Christ, take it upon himself to add extra commandments? The fact is, he wouldn't. No real Christian would. So, what was going on here? Well, the first verse of that chapter in the book of Acts gives us the answer. It tells us that certain men, known as Judaizers, were insisting that Gentile Christians needed to get circumcised. The meeting, related in Acts 15, was called to decide the matter. 
James disagreed with the need for circumcision, but in order to appease the Judaizers, decided to caution Gentile Christians against violating the more publicly obvious of the Jewish customs, such as engaging in lewd behavior, eating meat sacrificed to idols, or eating meat that had not been properly bled. The Bible clearly states that this was the reason for the decision, not that it was a commandment from God that involved a Christian salvation, but rather because, according to verse 21, From ancient times Moses has had those who preach him in city after city, because he is read aloud in the synagogues on every Sabbath. The advice was that these practices be abstained from, because Jews certainly would consider the eating of such meats as participating in heathen idolatry. Christian freedom did not obligate one to follow the dietary laws of the Jews. Paul makes this crystal clear in 1 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 10, where he writes that he, as a Christian, is perfectly free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Nevertheless, it was advisable that the Gentile Christians abstain from the use of their liberty in this matter, out of deference to the weaker brethren, Jews and Gentiles, who could not so deeply philosophize and whose consciences might be injured. A similar thought attaches to the prohibition of the use of blood. To the Jew it was forbidden, and under his covenant it was made a symbol of life, to partake of it would imply responsibility for the life taken. These prohibitions had never come to the Gentiles, because they had never been under the law covenant, but so deeply rooted were the Jewish ideas on this subject that it was necessary to the peace of the church that the Gentiles should observe this matter also. If they did not wish to be contentious and cause divisions in the church, the Gentile brethren would surely be willing to restrain or sacrifice their liberty respecting these matters. However, today there are no Jews or Christians, outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who would be stumbled by a Christian having a blood transfusion. So, the rationale behind the request that James made, no longer exists. Therefore, Christians are free to have blood transfusions. Well, that's certainly a pretty speech. But it's wrong. Gentiles were prohibited from blood, even though they were never under the Mosaic Law. Being descendants of Noah, they came under the everlasting covenant made with Noah after the flood. Didn't you make it past chapter 4 of Genesis in your seminary? There we read God's command. Only flesh with its life, its blood, you must not eat. I can comment on that. In Hebrew school we were taught from the Talmud that this means that we are not to eat flesh from a living being, not to bite into an animal that is alive, with its life still in it. Interesting, I hadn't considered that before, yet that's literally what the verse says. It's a prohibition against eating a certain type of flesh, living flesh. It's not a prohibition against blood at all. Oh. That's just hair-splitting semantics. It's obvious that God wants us all to abstain from blood. Well, there's another verse in the Bible that contradicts your idea that Gentiles were forbidden to eat blood. In Deuteronomy 14 verse 21 we read, You must not eat any animal that was found dead. You may give it to the foreign resident who is inside your cities, and he may eat it, or it may be sold to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to Jehovah your God. An animal found dead would not have been properly bled. That's why a Jew could not eat it, being part of a holy people, under a covenant with God, but the verse tells us that a non-Jew could eat it, blood and all. Surely you haven't been sacrificing people's lives on the basis of such flimsy misinterpretations of scripture. Have you? No, there's more to it than that. We see a consistent pattern throughout the Bible of God condemning the eating of blood. Leviticus 17 verse 14 is another clear instance. Leviticus? Isn't that part of the Mosaic Law? You know it is. But you already said, when I mentioned that your apparel violates that law, that Christians are no longer under that law. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand you? You didn't misunderstand. But I'm not using Leviticus here as a law, but as a principle. God hates the use of blood. Yet he created vampire bats, mosquitoes, and a host of other creatures who cannot survive without eating blood. He allowed Gentiles to eat unbled animals, and he allowed Paul, under inspiration, to state that a Christian could eat anything sold in the market without being concerned that they might be eating meat sacrificed to idols or meat from an unbled animal. Why would that be, if he hated it so much? Well, I don't claim to know everything. All I know is that if we try to save our life by violating God's laws, then we'll lose our everlasting life. 
That's a deeply held religious conviction that I'm sure even you gentlemen can appreciate. No! I can't appreciate it at all. In Hebrew school, we learned the rabbinic principle known as Pikwach Nefesh. Saving life supersedes God's law. That's wonderful. But we're Christians, not Jews. Oh, but Jesus lived by this principle as well. It's taught to us in Matthew chapter 12. At that season Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples got hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. At seeing this the Pharisees said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what it is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and the men with him got hungry? How he entered into the house of God, and they ate the loaves of presentation, food it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests only. Jesus didn't believe that one should starve to death before breaking a commandment. His actions and teachings show that he believed that God's commandments could be broken in life or death situations. As he said, the law was made for man, and not man for the law. It was meant to be a help in living a good life, not a cause for death. Your own Watchtower magazine reached the same conclusion when commenting on these verses, stating that Jesus was calling attention to acts of mercy on the Sabbath day, that it was perfectly legitimate to render a show of mercy to one who is in need even though it was the Sabbath, and that there is, in effect, no violation of the Sabbath by such course of action. So, even if you still mistakenly think that accepting blood violates God's law, then this principle should show you that when it comes to saving a life, there is no violation. And this is the uh, creator of the site, Watchtower Help Admin, who created these videos. If you go to this site, there's a lot of videos on here to help deprogram uh, someone that was in the Jehovah's Witness cult. I know for myself, uh, it really helped me a lot. So I'll leave a link to all of this in the description below. Okay, well that brings a conclusion to the news article from the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, Punishment and Control, the Secret Handbook that Rules the Jehovah's Witness Religion. So thanks again to uh, Ben Kuby, the writer of this article. And uh, as more of this information starts to come out, we will keep you guys informed. So thanks again, and until next time, folks, keep living your life with love. Bye for now.